Good evening and welcome to tonight's Bible study with the Lombard Church of the Nazarene. I'm glad you joined us again tonight as we continue our study through the book of Philippians. Uh, last time we talked about chapter 1 of Philippians tonight, we, we are going to look at chapter 2. Uh, just as a quick, quick review, um, Paul visited Philippi on his second missionary journey. And while he was there, he was arrested and, and, and flogged and but eventually was released and allowed to go. And while um, he has those memories there, uh, he also helped spread the gospel there before that. And so now that Paul is in prison in Rome, uh, he is writing some letters and he's reflecting back and also wanting to encourage people like the people in Philippi. So he writes this letter to Philippians, letting them know that God is advancing the gospel even though he's in chains. and. He's letting them know that even though they might be struggling there, uh, that God is with them. And even when it doesn't seem it, the gospel is still being advanced by the work of God's people. And so Paul is writing this letter to the Philippians to encourage them. Uh, if we uh, do a, a review here, we see that this was Paul's second missionary journey. Uh, we read about Philippi. If you want to go back and reread that story, it's in Acts chapter 16. Remember, Philippi is a Roman colony. There were Romans there. He's not really speaking to a Jewish crowd. It's very much to a Gentile crowd. He goes to a group of women by the river. A woman named Lydia is one of them. She gives her life to Jesus as, long, as well as her household, and they are baptized. And then Paul delivers a slave girl from a demon, and then the people get upset, her owners, because they can't make money off of her anymore, telling the future. And so that's how he ends up in prison. And so this is the context to which now Paul is referring back to and writing to encourage him. So let's look at chapter 2. It begins by saying that, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one mind. So here he's saying, uh, if you've been, been being encouraged and comforted and um, have a common sharing of the spirit and tenderness and compassion. He's saying, basically, if God is working in you and God's love and is working in you, the Holy Spirit is working in you, he's saying, then this is what um, we should see from you, that uh, you would be like-minded and have the same love, that God would be working in their minds and hearts, that they would be united by the Spirit of God. And uh, even though it sometimes seems like we're being bombarded by the world around us, that God's people should be united in mind and heart, that we should be allowing God to lead us and guide us and direct us. And that's where our heart should be, and that's where our minds should focus on where God is leading. Amen. He goes on to say in verse 3, Do nothing then out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. It's not about us. <laughs> he said, so value others above you. It's not about what you would choose or, or what you think is best. Churches sometimes get into these, um, these um, discussions and even arguments about how they would like to see things and what interests them. And really, uh, Paul saying, don't, don't get bogged down in, in your interest, but the interest of others. What will it take to, to bring peace and, and to minister and advance the gospel? Resist the temptations about making it about self. Then he goes on to say, in your relationships with one another, talking about them as the church there, we have the same, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. And now he's clarifying what that is. Uh, Jesus, who is being very nature, God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage or to be grasped. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in the, as the appearance of, of a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And uh, this famous passage here in Philippians is talking about the relationship of God's people. And they said, so let's have God's people, if we're 
as he said, of being of one mind earlier. Uh, this is what it means to have a mindset like Jesus, because our mindset should not be our mindset. It should be the mindset of Jesus. Jesus's mindset was making himself nothing, becoming a servant, being obedient, and even being obedient to death. And he said not only death, but death on a cross, meaning a humiliation. Jesus allowed himself at times to be humiliated. He allowed himself to, um, to just hand himself over to the people. Um, he made himself a servant for mankind. And so lo allowed himself to, in essence, be lowered um, and being obedient to what God's will was for his life. And that's what he's calling for us to be and what Paul is encouraging the church to be. We're to be obedient like Jesus was. We're to be servants like Jesus was. Our mindset, that's where our minds need to be. Now, our humanists will tell us our minds need to be somewhere else and we start arguing about this and this and and paul saying make your mindset be like jesus christ's mindset is he goes on to say therefore god exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above every name that at the name of jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under earth and every tongue should acknowledge that jesus christ is lord to the glory of god the father what happened to jesus after dying being a servant, being humble, and being obedient, God exalted him. So we're having the mindset of Jesus, knowing that we are this lifetime on this earth is not the time to be exalted. God will raise us up one day, and we will be with God forever. We don't exalt ourselves. This life is not about us. It's about God. It's about Jesus. We're following his example. And God lifted him up and put him at the right hand of the Father for what he has done. And we worship him. And... Uh, we lift him up and so we know that one day every knee will bow every tongue will confess and um, because of his obedience and so in the meantime we need to follow this mindset of Jesus to be be obedient as we're on this earth verse 12 then goes on to say therefore my dear friends as you have always obeyed not only in my presence but also in my absence continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to fulfill his good purpose. God has a plan for us. And so we need to be obedient to that plan. Be obedient to what God wants for our lives. And he says, I know you've been being obedient. I want you to continue being obedient and work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now this word work out means that we've got to keep doing it until completion. In other words, we don't say salvation is just a moment in time, but it's something we continue uh, to see being fulfilled in our life, all of our life here on earth until he calls us home. Now, this fear and trembling uh, is where some people say, well, what does that mean? We're supposed to be fearful? The Bible says don't be afraid. Well, this, this word for fear in its original language means reverence or respect. We are to have reverence in our salvation and respect for God in our our salvation why because we're called to be obedient so we have to respect the salvation that we are in we're not supposed to mistreat our salvation but respect God in it uh, in 2 Corinthians seven fifteen, uh, talking about Titus it says and his affection for you is even greater as he remembers the obedience of you all how you have received him with fear and trembling how they received him with fear and trembling it's not a, a bad thing like oh no it, it's a uh, reverence and respect they tr received titus with reverence and respect now this trembling i know some people are like are we supposed to be well if we're not fearful what does that that trembling mean and a lot of times it's translated as weakness that in our weakness and our respect for god we're just going to obey god and do what he asked us to do and so when they re received also titus with the fear and trembling they were doing it knowing that they needed the help of god and they respected him and the work that god's doing in his life for example in first corinthians 2 3 it tells us paul came with weakness fear and trembling and so some see the connotation of our weakness and trembling meaning that we know in all all of what we are we're not to think of ourselves more than we ought to but we come to god in this state of reverence him and and weakness and respecting him and being obedient to what he has for us and we treat each other um, with respect not thinking we are greater than what we are so then in verse 14 it says do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become 
blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warp and crooked generation. Then you will shine among the stars, uh, like the stars in the sky, and hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. Amen. So we're to be obedient, right? We're supposed to be reverent. We're supposed to come to God in humbleness. And we're not to be complainers. We're not to be arguing. Remember, it's not about us, right? We're supposed to be looking at God and looking to the interest of others. And this is what leads to purity. Purity is not focusing on self, but on God and serving others. And in that purity, in that humble state, is when we shine like a, like a light. Let our light shine, as the word says, or like a star in the sky. When we're obedient and reverent and not complaining and not arguing, we shine. Paul doesn't want to labor in vain. He wants to see the church become positive, obedient, and reverent. And then he says in verse 17, Even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all, so that you too should be glad and rejoice in me. This idea of a drink offering that a vine dresser would grow grapes, would prune them, take care of them, pick them, crush them, and when they would bring a sacrifice to God, like a, a lamb, they would also bring this cup from the vine and they would pour it out as an offering to God. And it was an act of service uh, to God and be bearing, pouring out to him. And Paul's saying, my life is like that. We grow, prune, crushed. You know, we suffer. And we talked about that last time. And I'm pouring out my life for God. It's all for him. It's not... Uh, for others, even though you're supposed to look to others' interests, but it's all for God. I'm pouring out my life as an offering to God from the whole aspect of my life. It is for him and for his glory. And we're supposed to rejoice together in our servanthood of him. Verse 19 then says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that also he may be, uh, that I, that I also, I'm sorry, may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show you genuine concern for your welfare, fair, for everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Christ. So we know that Paul speaks highly of Timothy. Uh, he calls him his son in other places, and he has been with Paul uh, for many years. And they're both genuinely caring about the Philippians and other believers. And they say uh, many don't really care. They might say they care, but they... They don't, or maybe looking at its own, own interests, but he's saying we care, and Paul says I care, and Timothy cares. And um, and so he's saying here, you know, what are his interests? Well, he's looking out for their interests, and Timothy would do the same. Verse 22 then goes on to say, But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. I am confident in the Lord that I might come as well. Timothy has grown. He has proved himself like a, a good son. And and I said Paul referred to him as a son. He says, but now Paul wants him to go and go to Philippi. He wants to be encouraged by what he hears and, and Timothy sees going on there. And Paul himself desires to come and be with them. Verse 25 then says, But I think it is necessary to pen, send uh, back to you Epaphrodi, Epaphroditus, <laughs> uh, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you send to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you in his distress because you heard he was ill. So Paul is referring to this individual Epaphroditus. He was a Philippian uh, messenger to Paul. It seems like they sent a messenger to Paul. And not only did he go as their messenger, but he sent some sort of care pack with them to help take care of his needs, whether it was money, food, supplies. Uh, he came to Paul. Now Paul is sending him back. It seems like this, he's the person that maybe is delivering this message uh, to the Philippian church. And he's saying the, this individual longs to be back with them. And Paul is sending him back after he was ill. And in verse 27, it says, Indeed, he was ill, and actually he almost died, but God had mercy on him, and not only, uh, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. And Paul's grateful that this individual didn't die, but that uh, he continued to live, and he's 
grateful for God's mercy there. He said, therefore, I'm more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you will be glad and may have less anxiety. He's saying, yes, he was sick and you heard he was sick, but guess what? He's doing better and God delivered him as, of his sickness and he's coming back to you, probably delivering this letter. He's hoping that's an encouragement to them and uh, that they would have one of their own back. And finally, in this chapter, it says, So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help that you yourselves could not give me. He's saying, he came out. Not everybody could come out to Paul, uh, but this individual did. And he says, welcome him back. He deserves the honor of be actually going out and, and doing what not all of them could do. And he said, he almost died in this process, so don't take it for granted. He risked his life for Paul. They couldn't all go, but he could. And there are others among us that God calls out, and they have to go abroad, or they have to travel, and uh, they give their lives to Jesus where others couldn't or can't in, in the life that they have on this earth. And, it, and he's saying, treat them with honor as well. We need to treat those uh, in the ministry, those who are being called, those who are being sent, treat them with honor. Amen. All right, well, that's Philippians chapter 2. Again, we're so glad that you joined us tonight. May the Lord help us and help us to stay focused, help us to be encouraged, help us to not make things about ourselves. help us to focus in on, on you, God. And Lord, help us to look to the interests of others. Help us not to argue, complain, help us not to backbite, help us to become pure of heart and just focused on you, um, and uh, may you be glorified in all that's said and done in our lives, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us again. Uh, next time, we will continue reading through the book of Philippians together. Remember, God loves you, and so do we.